and that you continue to this day. Our final speaker is Lainey Kinsley. Lainey first came to us in 2013 as an intern for Young Global Leadership Foundation, having just finished her master's from Berlin University. Today, she has become a UN professional, and she goes into the deepest, darkest conflict areas to do her extraordinary field work. Lainey? So thank you very much. It's really lovely to be with you here today, and thank you, Dr. Linda, for this amazing opportunity. So as Dr. Linda mentioned, I'm public information officer for the United Nations for the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, currently serving in Northeast Nigeria. And I always say one of my favorite parts about my job is being able to advocate on behalf of the people, the most vulnerable people in the world, suffering from conflict and suffering in crisis zones. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to be here today and raise awareness about what's happening in some of the parts of the world where I've worked, um, including previously in South Sudan in the peacekeeping mission. Uh, so today I want to look at the interconnection between education and so social protection in both humanitarian coordination and in peacekeeping, and look at some of the challenges that humanitarian actors and the UN are facing in the field, as well as some of the successes. And that being said, looking at protection as crucial to ensuring quality education and education as a means to foster social protection. So to start out, I wanted to define what is protection of civilians. And there are three ways to understand protection of civilians. The first is physical protection, which a lot of, which a lot of peacekeeping goes into. Is a person physically, their body, is there physical harm? But there's also a rights-based approach, are human rights being protected, as well as are there um, the stabilization and peace building as durable forms of protection to create the conditions for people to be protected without needing that physical protection. So education, both formal and non-formal, are crucial components to protecting and promoting human rights, as well as building peace, reducing poverty and vulnerabilities, and enhancing capacity to manage economic and social risks. Both contexts in South Sudan and Nigeria are ultimately protection crises. While the conflict dynamics are very different in both countries, more than 80% of the people in each of these countries that are affected are women and children. In both countries, providing quality education is a huge challenge. Yet education is crucial to social protection. And I think just uh, for the context of the, my presentation, I think it's also important to define uh, in, the con uh, in the context of protection of civilians the difference between refugees and internally displaced people because I'll be talking about that quite a bit. So a refugee is a person that crosses a border uh, fleeing from conflict and an internally displaced person is someone that remains within the country. Um, so that just being said, that'll come up later in my presentation. Um, so how does this relate to SDG 4? How does protection relate to SDG 4 quality education? So I've picked out a few uh, elements of SDG 4 that I think are particularly relevant. Uh, so target 4.7 in SDG 4 says, by 2030, ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others, through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of culture and peace and nonviolence, and global citizenship and appreciation of cultural diversity and culture's contribution to sustainable development. So now I'm going to give a broad overview of the context in Nigeria where I'm currently working now and have been for the past four months. So Nigeria is facing a 10-year conflict with non-state armed groups, more commonly known as Boko Haram, and is one, among one of the 10 most severe humanitarian crises in the world. Civilians continue to bear the brunt of a conflict that has led to widespread forced displacement and violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. This includes reports of extrajudicial killings, use of torture, arbitrary arrest and detention, and forced disappearances, abduction, rape, and other forms of sexual abuse, uh, especially against women. 
um, and it's also children are being targeted uh, to participate in non-state armed group or in, in either side of the conflict. Um, and, and that's where education also plays a really big role to keep them away and protect them from being um, uh, subscripted into armed groups. So since the start of the conflict in Nigeria in 2009, more than 27,000 27, civilians um, have lost their lives in the northeast part of Nigeria, which borders Chad, Cameroon, and Niger. Um, and thousands of, women, uh, thousands of women and girls have been abducted. 60% of school-aged children in northeast Nigeria are out of school, according to UNICEF, due to the ongoing conflict. And Nigeria as a whole, given that it is Africa's biggest economy and has the largest population, still only has a 60% literacy rate amongst adults. So what do I do in Nigeria with the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs? Well, we coordinate the humanitarian response among different actors that are providing life, urgent life-saving services, including education and protection. Um, so there are 69 partners currently working in Nigeria on the humanitarian response. Um, and I'm gonna, and um, as of now, there are 7.1 million people in the area that are in need of urgent life-saving humanitarian assistance, and 1.8 million people who are internally displaced, as I mentioned before, 80% of which are women and children. Now, humanitarians are aiming to reach, in 2019, 6.2 million people, with, and asking for $848 million in funding to do so um, across different sectors and in protection particularly. Uh, there are 4.7 million people um, that need protection services, which include legal services, legal advice, protection trainings, which uh, includes raising awareness of human rights, mine risk, as well as vulnerability screenings when internally displaced people arrive in new um, camp locations. Uh, so, the objectives for protection of and the humanitarian response are enhancing civilians' protection from harm and responding to specific needs and risks with timely and comprehensive protection services, and to improve affected persons' access to their rights and strengthen the overall protection environment, and to promote the creation of conditions for safe, voluntary, and durable solutions and enhance the freedom of movement, which is also very crucial for education because if people cannot be living in their own communities and accessing schools, then, edu then it's very, very difficult to achieve quality education or for them to reach education services. So now in terms of education um, in the humanitarian response in Northeast Nigeria, there are 1.5 million people targeted for emergency education support, which includes rehabilitating learning spaces, providing school materials, training teachers, and providing psychosocial support uh, to people that have been affected by the conflict, who fled from violence, um, and who are living outside of their homes. Um, and one of the, there's a huge, actual, there's a huge gap in the humanitarian response as it relates to education, because it's so, so difficult to reach some of the areas. So for example, in 2018, the target was to reach 2.2 million people with education, emergency education support. And in the end, only 348,000 people were reached. Uh, and what we see uh, happening a lot in Northeast Nigeria, especially over the last four months, is an increase in military operations, an increase in tensions between um, the armed groups and the military, which leads people to flee. So just in the course of two months, there were about 42,000 people who fled from one area that's closer to the border of um, Niger into the capital of Borno State, which is where I'm working. So 42,000 people all of a sudden come into a place looking for protection, looking for shelter, looking for education, and they come into these camps for internally displaced people having little or nothing. And what we saw happening is in one of the camps, and in and actually many of the camps across the area where we cover, is that people are using schools as places to stay. And so then education services can't be provided to kids because they're being occupied by internally displaced people. Um, and so one of the response that we did is there was uh, one camp in particular, actually just 600 meters away from where I'm living, that went from a population of 8,000 internally displaced people to over 30,000 and only has the capacity, the humanitarian actors only had the capacity to provide for 10,000 people. 
So is that overpopulation of around 20,000 people living in schools inside of that camp that were supposed to provide education services. But what we did as a humanitarian community is identified a new place to build a new camp uh, where about 20,000 people are currently being relocated and where they are, have built already five schools and are planning to build 20 more. So that's, the challenge of course is great, that it's very difficult to provide education services, but there are, there, the response is ongoing. Um, and of course, protection of civilians is, is key to ensuring access to education. And there's access, and access to some of the people is constrained due to the ongoing conflict. And without quality education services, children lack protection and are at risk of being recruited into armed groups. And also don't develop the skill sets to be able to earn livelihoods in the future. Now I'm going to shift to where I worked previously for almost two years in South Sudan with the United Nations peacekeeping mission there. So I'll provide a broad overview of the context there. So South Sudan is in East Africa, borders on Kenya, Ethiopia, um, and is the world's youngest country founded in 2011. And civil war broke out in 2013, and it is also a protection crisis. Um, nearly 400,000 civilians have lost their lives uh, in the conflict, um, and that's why the peacekeeping mission is there. And the mandate of the peacekeeping mission is to protect civilians, create the conditions conducive to the delivery of humanitarian assistance, monitor and investigate human rights, and support the implementation of the peace process. Um, so currently there are two million South Sudanese refugees in neighboring countries, of which one million are in Uganda. And the UN peacekeeping mission has six protection of civilian sites, housing almost 200,000 people, which are managed and the security is provided by the peacekeeping mission. Uh, but there are humanitarian actors providing both education and protection services uh, within these um, protection of civilian sites. 2.4 million South Sudanese children are out of school, according to a UNESCO UNICEF report, and the literacy rate in South Sudan is only 25%. And that lack of education is, actu is an actual playground for so-called intellectuals and politicians who are easily manipulating uneducated communi communities and leading them to conflict. Uh, while the, the families of these politicians are living comfortably and sending their kids to school outside of the country. Um, and improving and investing efforts in, t in an education system and increasing the literacy rate, especially among women, is actually conflict prevention, is a conflict prevention mechanism um, which will help to build a better understanding of the general situation and eventually reach uh, a stable and uh, democratic situation in the country. Um, and one of the things that I noticed as far as education, which, was, um, which really struck me in my heart, was the lack of teachers, the lack of competent teachers, lack of teacher availability. And the teachers that I met there, they were so dedicated, but they were literally living off of $5 a month, if that. Um, in very, very remote areas, really hard to reach, uh, and, and basically doing their jobs on a voluntary basis, despite the fact that they also did, had little or nothing. Um, and some of the examples, though, and, and I also want to touch on non-formal ways of education, um, which is important to protection, which is sensitizing people on human rights. So in these contexts, and especially in South Sudan, people don't even know what their rights are. There is no rule of law. And even the police officers who are supposed to be providing protection are not educated as to what international human rights even are and, and how to protect them for their own citizens. So we went with United Nations police, doing raising awareness uh, on human rights um, for the police, yeah, for South Sudanese police, for military, etc., as well as facilitating peace dialogues between communities so that they could get an education on how to better understand each other and also understand the repercussions of, of engaging in violent conflict. Um, so I just want to share some of my, now some examples of my experience in South Sudan. Um, Actually, after my first month of being there, I went on what we call a mission patrol to a remote area where clashes had happened just two weeks before. And we arrived there and just found this town where it's a previously a population of maybe 30,000 people, almost completely deserted. And we went to the school, and the only one that was left there was the teacher. And the school was completely ransacked, absolutely looted, everything taken away from the school. Um, yet the teacher was still there, and it was the teacher who had brought all of his students to safety across the border as these clashes were going on, across the border to Uganda, 
and then came back to see if there were any kids left. Um, and this, this also speaks to the, the absolute urgency to advocate for schools being protected as zones of peace. Um, and also the challenge of why children are not going to school. Um, then another example of, uh, of an instance that happened while I was working in South Sudan, there was, uh, there was an orphanage just about six kilometers away from where I was living. And the military mounted operations just outside of the orphanage against opposition groups. So the orphanage was an, at imminent risk of being caught in the crossfire. And so what we did from the peacekeeping mission side is negotiate and mediate between these two groups to prevent them from, have, from carrying out clashes in front of this orphanage, which in the end protected the lives of 260 kids and also enabled their access to education because if something more serious had happened, the school would be destroyed. Um, okay, I'm almost there. Um, and then the last example that I want to mention is a program that I launched in South Sudan called Youth Peace Ambassadors. So we identified two pupils from every school in the town, 17 schools, one male, one female, to be trained in peace, conflict, resolution, human rights, and youth leadership. Uh, and we did these trainings with them, but also provided them a platform to advocate on their behalf. So we provided them with the skills they needed to be able to uh, speak out and also serve as conflict resolution ambassadors in their own communities. And what we found out after this program is that these kids were so happy to be involved because they also, it was also preventing them from engaging in activities they didn't really want to. One of them said to me, yeah, now we have this, so we're not going out and you know doing criminal things or drinking alcohol with our friends. Um, so it provided them an opportunity to, uh, to protect themselves by educating themselves on what their rights are and also how to mitigate conflict. Um, and so this, this example of this program is uh, an, a perfect example of employing formal and non-formal methods of education and providing safe spaces for youth to enable them to access education and use it as a tool to participate in pushing for their own protection and that of their communities. And I just want to finish with a poem that they wrote, um, which they presented on United Nations Day in South Sudan to their government officials advocating for peace. So, I dream of a world peace where people can live a life of ease, where there is no difference between rich and poor, life being pleasant for living evermore. I dream of a world happiness where there is no sign of selfishness, where each and everyone can benefit his needs and believe in their own needs. I dream of a world kindness where people can know that the value of love is priceless, where people can realize on this earth we are all children, and to have a kind heart is better for all men. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lainey. Your carriage, care. And equally important, your courage to do what you do is truly extraordinary. And thank you for sharing the human dimension of a population that most of us do not know and remain invisible. Today you have enlightened all of us in the room. Thank you, Lainey.